you can hear them too, can't you? Can't you? Just out there everywhere. It's quite amazing. Interrupting this current neocoronial, coronial, the coronial, the A in there, coronial. Has this been the most obvious scam in the world? And look at who fell for it. Amazing. Just amazing. We're interrupting this coronial, coronial. I just, folks, I just don't get it. The cricketism. Just interruption. Do you get it, folks? We have to interrupt this. The silence is deafening. So we got to bring you behind the woodshed. This cricketude busting episode is BTWRLM391. It's really not that hard. It's unfamiliar, but it's not that hard. I'm going to show you some stuff today. We're going to go through some things. You know, I was telling you last week about the lawsuit that was filed that has been served, and I want to touch a couple of things like that. I'm not going to go through too deep. It's still in the beginning stages. You know I don't like promoting, but we're going to give you a head, heads up about it, and I'm going to explain to you those that have been looking for an example. This may be part of it. So it's not resisting to say resist. I see so many people like, like to type resist, and then that's the end of their work. But if you have no other thought on how to get you behind woodshed to learn you a thing or two, and I hope I've been doing this for 10 years, everyone's familiar, be the storm behind the woodshed. And I did, I typed that into DuckDuckGo. It was funny. It came right up, folks. You put be the storm behind the woodshed, and RLM pops up behind the woodshed. Pretty cool. Thank you, Grimner, for the SEO or whatever they do there to bring us up in uh it's up to you. You don't take any lip from the official miscreants. It's clearly set up this way today. We see, can, without an opinion, see how easy they went and done it. And no one checked them on it. And I just find that fascinating. This is really an interesting condition. I told you all you're on the right side of history to go against this. And to a man and woman, you can stop this thing. And I'm going to touch that again, like I said, a little bit later. But right now, I want to touch real quickly on BitChute, Torn Earth Shaman, comment. And I have to let you all know, uh, my comments aren't, uh, my notifications are not coming through. And I'm not going to be able to go back through and find who did comments and things. But I happened to, on something told me, go look. And there was a comment on, I guess it was the last broadcast. And over at Minds.com, thank you for all the interest last week. I do appreciate you tuning in and tuning on and turning around and turning it out. Get the information out, folks. This is all for us to do. And it's, I know, again, it's the maybe weird topics, but this is how, how we are set up. And wherever there's the brand, the professional union brand of rule, o law, and democracy, what I say should be applicable. And there's adjustments in every state. Every country has to be adjusted, but they're pretty much consistent. And so if you want to stop this or at least become the crew that steps up to start to really put the pressure to the people that are, violating you this is the this is this topic to do it now Turner Raman asks uh, or tells me in criticism says you're not correct about the PCR tests and you need to research it better the PCR test has been advanced as a technology greatly since it was invented and so I just replaced the answer and this is the answer that you really need to look at it's not an opinion for me it's what is being said in the documentation it's what they're utilizing and sourcing and the advancements that I have understood have only been to how fast uh, how the, the reagents they use to try and bring something along to get the, the DNA, the excuse me, the hybrid uh, uh, RNA to be multiplied, amplified. It, it doesn't make it any better. And it was utilized uh, still, it's still only for research. And the reason why it makes sense now to me as I was thinking about all this is that it, in a research setting, when you have an isolate, you can then amplify that and you have a, 99.9% .9 understanding, at least by your studies, that it's going to be the pure amplified DNA genome. It's not a garbage can, which is what our immune systems end up doing and working so wonderfully to do. And so my answer to that, that it's, I'm not correct on the PCR test and the advancement of the research, it's notwithstanding whatever the opinion might be, whatever someone might feel about what I'm saying, what is being promoted by the government the word, the admissions from the government is this, that there's no quantified virus isolates for the 219 N-Cove are currently available, as you can find in the diagnostic panel. And that's 
if you get the old one in March, when I pick these up at page 38, you go to page 39, it, it says the same thing. And But it also goes on to say, I think at page 2, our results are for identification of uh, 2019 NCOV RNA. Remember, that's the renamed SARS-CoV-2. But you go on farther, and you've got to go look through the document to see this. It also says detection of the viral NA, and, uh, and RNA may not indicate the presence of infectious virus or that 2019 NCOV is causative agent for clinical symptoms. It also says that this test cannot rule out diseases caused by other bacterial and viral pathogens. So whatever our disagreement is on the quality of this test, the emergency rule of use and utility of this test will not find what they're looking for, and that has not been actually isolated. That was on an implication that this was the uh, our SARS-CoV-2, as it was then, 219 NCOV, uh, was uh, the causative agent. That's all been presumptive. You haven't seen anything. It's just an implication. And that's the original documentation that was written out of China. So if, when you keep tracking through this, and whatever the PCR test is, it, the education to us, the way you, the rules that you use that under, don't give us anything, any information. So I'm going to go with the officials because that seems to be exactly what's happening. It's a fraud. It's an ongoing fraud. It's going to continue to be an ongoing fraud. And there's no way to get around it. If there's no isolates, if they have no isolate, how can the PCR test, I don't care if it's 100% accurate, how can it find it? It can't. And then you don't have the idea that it's been modified by the process itself and or it may be in our system already. Remember, it's a coronavirus. And they tell us it mutates. Why people haven't picked up on this and have allowed the system, the gamers, to play us like I showed last week. They're playing us that they can modify this stuff. And remember, CRISPR technology sits right there to do all this stuff. They can hack something to your Franken genomes if they want. And they tell us at the UN uh, documentation it's going to be an endless emerging disease system now. All since the Biodiversity Treaty. There's 1992 before most of us were even thinking about this stuff. These people were on the hunt. And so I, I don't want to get into too much of a dis uh, discussion about this, but the by the official documentation, however, the PCR may have been advanced. That's not how they're using it. And so I'm going to stick with my information. If you have more, please tell us because it's important for us to keep ahead of it. Why? Not because we can expect them to give us the information, because the so-called appropriate medical experts can give us the information. We need to find out for ourselves. I've told you a long time ago when I started talking about this in January, March, or February, whatever it in there, I said, watch out, there's a needle in the haystack of noise. And we're going to have to keep track of that if we can't. Keep track of really looking for the silence and what's going on. So thank you for the uh, comment and thank you for the criticism, but I'm not going to move from what I have, what my, my evidence is, and that's what I want to talk to you about in evidence. The evidence of what's available and what can we do about some of this stuff, not just talk about it. Again, you can say resist all you want. Until you start res actually resisting in proper ways, it means really means nothing. I want to expose something here, not for the sake of the news. It's very important information. I don't talk too much about it. It's a very important story in the world. Uh, but there's so much wrapped around it. I've already told you I've offered what I could. I don't get silence. I get crickets back from the attorneys. I know why. Typically, that's what happens around me. And so when I offer some things right in the law it, and I get crickets back, I realize there's a, there's a it's pretty quick proof there's a scam going on. And we're talking about here exposed how British intelligence manipulated the Julian Assange trial. Now, we can go through the discussion. I can read the news to you. And it talks about the judge uh, being uh, have a, whose husband's with the British intelligence. The son is involved with uh, surveillance security information uh, companies and uh, how they're utilizing uh, all that to go against Julian Assange. Well, Julian Assange is a, has been confirmed in another court case to be at a publisher. WikiLeaks is a publication. And uh, so they can charge him under all this. But what I want to point out to you is something you have to do in the world, which I don't see happening at all. The attorneys aren't doing it. The people, the reporters aren't doing it. Everybody who's looking at this, and I'm not saying it's the only thing. I'm saying this is another thing I, I see doesn't get hap it doesn't happen. You can do this locally, and yes, it's probably somewhat of a measure of futility, but if enough, again, this is a numbers, this is a mass thing. If enough people have the right discussion, and you're on point, and it's not a form letter, you come by your own little words, I don't care how, how minimal it is, and you're on point, and a lot of people start showing up with the right thing that the system is afraid that you identify, 
you can start to have a real effect. So in this story where we start seeing the truth of it finally coming out, that there's a Julian Assange trying to be manipulated by, a, a, by intelligence, which is really what the United States is attacking him on, and their embarrassment and all that, and this nonsense, complete nonsense, would be for those of you that are involved and want to do something, you have the power a bit. It's, it's still the peanut gallery, but the peanut gallery can really make a lot of noise. That peanut gallery needs to start identifying. There's a lots of these things that come on on the appearance of impropriety. We'll just put it in the most basic, simplest thing that the system is afraid of you finding out. It doesn't have to be a proven problem. It just has to appear improper. Now they're going to try and and do the slippery eel thing, and and that's now that you know that, then you're going to have to tie your facts together very tight, so that the slippery eel can't get away. But enough of you start talking about this and other things about the appearance of impropriety, if not impropriety, right up front. And you write your letters to the judicial system, maybe even the queen. She's going to pass it off as the politics or whatever the heck she's going to do. You just keep nailing her about that on how that's not proper for her to oversee. It's not because the system it's futile to do what you're doing, but you're doing it anyway. That if they, they want to continue the charade, then just call it a charade, but stop the nonsense of what it looks like for real, like this is justice. And if the peanut gallery starts to get involved and they start doing the proper uh, letters uh, on point, I think you're going to start, you'll start to get, again, for me, it's, I see a lot of people that have a writer's block or they're just got, uh, they're preoccupied. They're occupied all right, but they don't know on what, on what. That if you just got back in the habit of writing Simple letters. Take your, slow down, find out what really irks you about something, and focus in on on the subject matter at hand, and do your best book report, if you will, or even just a, a nice letter that says that uh, this issue, this, this, these facts, these facts are uh, now uh, beyond uh, an appearance of impropriety, beyond a conflict of interest. And then you address maybe even the excuses that might have you tracked down the excuses they've used. Well, we can be independent nonetheless. You would look at that and you make a comment to that one too. Doesn't have to be many things. The peanut gallery can speak in the Julian Assange travesty. I've talked about this before and the attorneys that were involved and who they're put like the attorneys. If it's not just the bar association attorneys that are back there and they're what they're solicitors and things like that. It's ends of court. They're all come from the same source. It's not that problem. You have these attorneys that are actually arguing both sides over time for the governments. And so it's you to speak up because when you don't, there's no one, no one pays attention. And if only a few of you do, do like a lot of us have over the decades, there's a lot of us, a few people listen to me have been doing this for a long time. You know what I'm talking about. You just don't get listened to. There's just not enough. And so you kind of throw your hands up. For some reason, I'm a little bit more stubborn than that. And I figure and keep figuring ways and, it has been an interesting uh, journey, but it also has been yielding some results. It just takes a little bit longer. Actually, it takes a lot longer, but you do, can do some important important work. So getting back to this, for those of you that are interested in Julian Assange, if you would please consider writing a letter to whomever. Find out who it is. I can't do all the work here. Find out who would be the people you would send a letter to complain that this is an appearance of impropriety and if the deeper you want to get into this better the fine that's great do what do what you feel comfortable with but at least put a word out so i guess that's my only point on this this is just an ongoing travesty all these things are noticed to us of what's going on and you are then given the ability to write letters even though it sounds futile and may not get and you, you a lot of you that do this you hear you see the silence you see that there's the emperor wears no clothes. The minion of the emperor wears no clothes. And we come to COVID and we're, I'm watching this globe get knocked, locked down. It's just an amazing problem. Okay, so I don't know what, it's really us. It's really on us. I've been saying this for years about it. So let's move on here quick. Something off, a little off, uh, off of a point, but it's, a, again, the totalitarian manipulation of information. I didn't, um, it's to us the notice, I didn't really think about this in the beginning, then it started to strike me a bit, uh, kind of like off the left center, but, or right center, whatever center you are, whatever, whatever uh, who knows, whatever side you're on. Uh, the new California law prompted by crash that killed Kobe Bryant. Now, I, I, put, I take a little bit of interest in this and flying and, and things, and somehow it just doesn't go away, you learn to fly, and it just, every of these stories just pop up, you want to know how, whether or not I'll ever fly again, I don't know. But it's always been an interest for me to analyze, uh, if you can, ahead of time. 
how how um, the crash happens. And I did uh, my little analysis and I put forward, but that's what got me was that this new law prompted by the crash says that there, apparently all those pictures that we got were were gotten by uh, the um, emergency responders, and apparently that was uh, not supposed to happen. We weren't supposed to see all that. And so there's now a new law that says the first responders aren't supposed to take pictures and uh, give them to the public. And the complaint was that there was apparently uh, dead bodies in the uh, in the in the carnage. Now to tell you the truth, I never saw one. So to me, I guess I don't notice. And maybe I wasn't really looking for it. And if I did, maybe my mind shut it off. I wasn't looking for dead bodies. I was looking for information. And the photographs for me it appears to me now, even in hindsight, was very important. Here's the point. You you take a Julian Assange and you you cut out his information or WikiLeaks, and you don't get that information, and you're going to be a lot well. You're going to be ignorant, aren't you? You're going to be proceeding in that ignorance, whether you have a choice in it or not. Same thing here. That again, information. The, the first responders uh, now can't g give these pictures. Why it struck me eventually, it finally because I didn't even really think more about this for about a week or two, and then it, it occurred to me. I used those pictures, and in fact, I put a, a Twitter out which I did my own analysis but ahead of time, and just because it's just an interest of mine. With all the stories flying around, I, I just wanted people to hear something about that wasn't being talked about. It has to do with when you're flying in, in instrument conditions. Your body, you cannot trust your body at all. There's conditions that the, air, the aircraft can get into that your body does not sense correctly. If it hadn't been for that experience, I don't think, I don't, I think I could approach this the way, but the photographs help me to verify for me, at least in anticipating a condition, that, that what would have happened on the ground looked like what I saw immediately after the accident. In other words, those photographs, not looking at the carnage and the dead bodies and all that, that spectacularism that, that goes on, in looking at trying to figure out how this thing happens. Why? Because there's thousands of pilots flying that may find themselves into that condition, that may need to have that information, that dis, it, something just never clicked about that condition that we could then understand to stay out of it in case it gets it with you. Because in this case, I anticipated the pilot only had about five or six seconds once he made his maneuver. And you heard that on the audio, and I responded to all that. But at any rate, so here we have a, they're stopping, uh, Julian, they're, they're stopping the information we have. And then this new California law, you're not looking at politics here, just the law about it. And I understand the sentiment that you want to have uh, for the new first responders not taking carnage and, and, pa and pa passing it around. But in this case, this is, this is vital information for anybody with an interpretative mind to look at and make, at least even if I was, uh, for myself, I could say, wow, that's a really nasty condition to get into. I only have five seconds, and this is what happened. I better be aware. I stick that in my little mind, and I sit there and I put there as one of my rest, your, 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 your double checks, your triple checks about are you looking right? Are you doing right? Can you convey that to somebody else who might find themselves in the immediate time? Because every right after he crashed, there was other people in the air. If they, they put this law in, we will not have that information. We will be ignorant now. Something that I believe I used in watching... The track of the, the crash track, if you will, across the mountain correlated af after I started thinking about it, when I went back to the pictures, it correlated with what I thought would happen in a condition. So my interest in this now is just to tell you, you we as a people have to be vigilant to make sure that they don't keep information from us. You know, people who don't aren't interested in this maybe don't find a value. And I don't have a value pri privately to me with the information. But this definitely is information that people that are flying have to, to think about. You know, again, it, it's an interesting problem. If physic, your body just does not respond in a, in, a, in a cloud, in an aircraft, the way you would think. It just does not. That's why I say res rely on your instruments. And this pilot apparently had too much going on for as fast as he was moving his ship. And he went down. And there's a condition that happens in that attitude that none of those people knew they were going down. And then he only had five seconds to figure it out. So, tragedy. Not a good thing. I'm not getting into all the who he was. I don't know nothing about Kobe Bryant, Nebraska, none of that. I don't get into all that. 
The problem is for me is that they're gonna if California just shut out primary information that we would have immediately that people immediately could use. Now, if they want to limit the carnage and say, okay, let's there's dead bodies, okay, we're gonna respect the dead. I appreciate that. But to come out and say we're not gonna get information, lock the door and hand it over to the experts is something we need to be vigilant against. And not just on this, on anything. That's why the Julian Assange case becomes very important. Whatever you think on Julian Assange, I got no thoughts. It's He's just a guy in the world who does what they do. I don't know. I've never been into journalism. I've never been a repository, a database for information. I just know I see lots of information that doesn't get used, and we go down like COVID, and we keep being pummeled as people by politics. Anyway, so this was this one kind of touched me a bit when I realized, you know what? If I didn't get those pictures right away, I couldn't have made the assessment, the accurate assessment I did of what happened to that pilot and that those people. And that didn't maybe translate to me very directly, but it certainly conveyed a concept to other people who may have seen it and kept them at least in the five seconds that they would have had if they got themselves into that condition. You try not to get in that condition, first of all. That was the first mistake. But once you get there, you got to come back out. And so I have, I have some links about this. You can read about it. I just got more. And more I talk about right now, I'm getting more and more troubled the inability to get accurate information is critical. Look at, again, the COVID is going to be a central hub. The ever-changing pieces of information, what, you, what I told you a long time back, you have to focus on, get rid of the noise and focus on the core issues. Get right to the foundation as first, fast as you can and don't let go because there's going to be someone trying to knock you from that position. And here we have no information coming out. Now we're going to have to take that information from the experts Eight months later or so when they finally come up with what they want to give us in California. And so I want you to think about it. To me, that's very serious. You have a governments now that are going to decide because they're the sovereign, but you're not entitled to the information. And to me, this is an immediate thing. I don't know about a lot of you, but to me, it was an immediate thing. I can tell you if I was flying, I'd want to know about being able to look at that. In fact, that's how I consider it. And there was a lot of people that are pilots looking at that. I was watching the conversations. And so, this is important. This information that you don't get is important. The withholding of information is absolutely critical to understanding how you're going to proceed in anything. And so having a government step up and do that underneath the cover of sentimentality is pretty uh, profound in a way because look what they do it's a they give the necessity and then all of a sudden you don't get what's a necessity to you because all of a sudden now you have second class necessity and so this is a I better move on because this has been the overall if they don't do it like by terminological cover obfuscation they they do it like this where they just keep the information from you what was it national security it's always an excuse and, and then we're going to find out, like, and as I move on to this next case, very important. Now, totally different. Where that helicopter crashed is now what I'm going to go to, the ground, the law of the land, like I talked about. I was surprised not very many people were interested in that. I figured people would be interested in the law of the land. No, not your constitutional condition at the federal level. No, the one you stand on, the very foundation underneath your feet, such that it might be a foundation. I guess that was a shout out to the giant meteor. Hooper versus Scheimer, folks. Um, talking with my colleague, he does patents. He does a book. He actually literally wrote the book. Wrote the book on it. I've had him on my broadcast years ago on another broadcast network. I was talking to him uh, just a couple days ago, inquiring on any successes to see what was going on, how they were running the success, what was the courts doing. Ran across a very interesting, two interesting cases in California, in a very interesting condition in Montana relying on the patent, the ground, the the title, the ultimate title to the land, which everything has to rest on at this point in this reality, and uh, from which we have a, a lot of our rights and abilities, if we understood that better. So such things as COVID would never be able to interfere with us, but we, we've lost that in ourselves, and we've lost the, somehow we've lost the spirit to go after it in earnest, to, to rest that back for ourselves. But this little uh, Hooper versus Scheimer case came up in our discussion again. 
And I just want you to know, those of you that have, have land or are attached to land by even a contract, there's an underlying right uh, of ultimate evidence that cannot be overthrown by the courts, cannot be overthrown by a, 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 an infant in, an aggression. It cannot be overthrown actually by a mortgage. It cannot be foreclosed against. And I wanted to mention this to you because, again, this is a piece of evidence and official record. This is information that if you aren't aware of it, is the difference between having and not. And it also exposes an ability for you to defend yourself and or find out when the one who was supposed to do had the duty again. You have the written obligation and duty to protect or secure failed. You can get that one for trespass on the case, trespass of the property, and official malfeasance, if nothing else, which um, amounts to uh, felonies, actually, as I've talked to you before. But this little case I want to read real quickly. Some of it's uh, kind of uh, it's an explanation of land. It can be kind of complicated. you got to work slow through the facts. We're not interested in how the land was laid, but we're wanting to know the interaction with the land, where the courts have authority and where they don't. We're talking jurisdiction. Where am I going? I'm going to build up into a court case in, a, in, a, in, an author- in the authorities of the officials that everybody gives lip service to. We don't have a control of the government, but no one will step up to do the control. And no one is not absolute here, just for those of you that tend to do that to me. Well, I've done, I understand that. I'm talking about those that don't work. And in most places, the COVID is pretty universally, no one's doing much. Uh, well, and maybe, maybe last week, there might have been one case that we're going to talk about here real soon. But this case about Hooper versus Scheimer, 1859, folks, this is even before the mining law. I can read in the in this, uh, I'll give you a couple links to it. There's a couple different discussions. For the second link, I'll just go quickly there because it says in here, I found very interesting, Nathan E. Hooper, Louisa J. Hooper, Amanda E. Hooper, minors by Absalom Fowler, their next friend, plaintiffs in error, and Jacob Scheimer, their next friend. There's a thing in law you can do your next friend as a helper. I don't necessarily advocate that. We've done that in the past. It doesn't work out quite as well as you'd think. However, it is some support, and if you have a, a team of people that can work too, if you will, the, the plaintiff or defendant and the next friend, you can work pretty well, but you're going to be shut down by the court is what we found. So found next, I found that 1859 next to friend was part of the list, part of the thing. It's the thing, the thing they used to do. So getting back to the case of Hooper versus Scheimer, reading from the uh, wiki source. And the reason why I want to chose the wiki source is because there's a whole lot of case citations and little phrases, little statements from cases that were... For those of you that, un- that want to know more about your land and where your rights come from, whether that's the right to, to use the road, the highway, whether that's your land, whether that's protecting yourself and your land so that you are the king of your domain, you want to understand that? This case was reminded to me about, and it's I, as I was reading the cases, I'm thinking, well, this is the citation to the, over in Jefferson Mining District, we have a miner's rights page. I think it's the Wilbur case that says that your, your mining claims are secured as if patent has issued. And I see the, I see one of the phrases that were cited in this case in 1859 predating the 1866 load law. And there's a, there's a thing before the load law that comes in. It actually, Congress was required to actually, in a way, make the load law. They didn't have to, but they were required because in 1964, a case, the Sparrow case came in and said that the Congress had for forbade the miner to be in the public land, and therefore it had given the miner the mineral. So land law is a very powerful antecedent. And this is even before the mining law, this case. So when we're talking about long-term, you think this stuff doesn't exist, it's there. And it works if you know to bring it forward. You only get the rights you assert. This case also explains that someone brought their chain of title to the patent. And it was recognized. So when I talk about this stuff, this is not, again, this is not just my own idea, this is the next next cool silver bullet. These are the requirements when you go to defend yourself that are required. I try to tell you all that. I don't try to go off too far on what, uh, certainly what, you know, what my opinions are on some of these. These are things, tools to apply, it, where they're applicable. In this case, go, it was brought up on a writ of error from the Circuit Court of the United States of the Eastern District of Arkansas, Arkansas, 
It was uh, an injectment brought by the Hoopers against Shimer for an undivided one-fourth part of lots numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, in block number 10, in that part of the city of Little Rock, lying east of the Quapaw Line, and known as Governor's Pope's Edition, and are embraced in the northwest fraction quarter of section number 2, in the township and 1 north range 12 west. And I read that started laughing because every miner has to write his paperwork for claiming the land pretty much like that. So, if you got to be somewhat a, of a knowledge. You can be a dumb miner. you got to be somewhat knowledgeable. And so, we keep moving because this is how it all works. And there's not a mind in the, in the society much to keep up with this. But we should have. And this is what it, it's kind of funny to just be a miner to go out and make our claims. And we got to speak like the 1800s. It's really fascinating. The plea was not guilty on this case upon the original case was a plea of not guilty upon the trial at the, of the issue by a jury. A verdict for the defendant was returned and he had judgment for costs. A verdict for the defendant was returned and he had judgment for costs. So the defendant lost. Okay, so you got to understand now it's on a, now it's moving forward. The mode of bringing an ejectment in Arkansas is merely to state in the declaration that the plaintiff was entitled to possession of the property and the defendant entered upon it and ejected the plaintiff therefrom. Hoopers were the heirs of Clo Cloes and claimed under his preemption, which had been mentioned more than once in these reports. The defendants claimed under a patent embracing the lots in controversy, to the reading of which, in evidence, the plaintiff's objective on the ground that it was inoperative and void as to the said northwest fraction quarter of which said preemption had been established because said fraction quarter had been previously appropriated to the private use of said Nathan Cloes, deceased, and that such patent had been issued without authority, in violation and without warrant of law, and for land not subject to be granted or patented. But the court overruled the objection and permitted the patent to be read, whereupon the plaintiffs accepted. The exception that they did is preserving their rights at court in trial for appeal. That's all that means. The, there, was, there was other evidence of both sides given upon the trial, but it is not necessary to mention it in this report. After the evidence was finished, the plaintiffs offered two prayers to the court, to the purport of which was to declare the patent inoperative and void, which prayers were refused. The defendant offered five which were granted, of which it is only necessary in this report to notice the two following. So the answer to this case of ejectment was that we have a patent right. And we have a document that evidences that. In this case, the, the defendant had actually a patent chain in evidence that he could present to the court. 1859. Number one, it goes on to say, the patent from the United States conveying the fee to the northwest fraction quarter of section two in the township, one north of range 12 west, to the grantee na therein named, dated 2nd November 1833, not appearing to be void, is a complete and paramount legal title and must prevail in this action over the title of the plaintiffs. And any e equities that may exist between parties behind it can only be assisted and be made available in a court of chancery, but cannot affect the patent in this action. And in the jury believe, and if the jury believed that the undivided interest mentioned in the declaration is embraced in the patent as a portion of said tract, the finding of the jury should be for the defendant. Now I'm going to interject here because later on in this list, I'm not going to read most of this stuff here in the, in the attachments. Uh, so I think it's a judge. He just goes off. He just says, you cannot, there's this no, I, how did anybody get the idea you can put property before a jury? The ignorance of the jury, the well intention of the jury, the intelligence, doesn't matter. You cannot give to a jury the determination of a settled property by the government. Pretty much what I've been saying all along. 
But now I have the source for you to read for you, the black and white. You can see, you can do the research. You don't want to take this and run. You want to take this as a beginning kernel to expand your knowledge and do the, as I talk about these things. You can apply this and the things you can find. So the patent was uh, important. The, the jury should have found in, for, in favor of the patent, and they didn't is your first clue that you don't want to run these to, to juries. Well, juries are at law, courts at law, jurisdictions at law. Chancery is equity. In an equity case, you do, the, the, settled, the facts are settled pretty much by titles or evidence, uh, direct evidence, um, things provable, things intangible. And the court applies the law to those and then comes out with its, its decision. In this case, it says here the patent should prevail, notwithstanding what the jury said. Going on here. The mere act, the, uh, that the action of ejectment is founded on legal title and that the plaintiffs must recover on the strength of their own title, that a patent from the United States is a higher and better legal title and must prevail in an action of ejectment over an in entry with the register and receiver or a preemption right under the laws of the United States, notwithstanding the state statute may authorize an action of ejectment to be instituted on the latter and maintained against a person not holding under a superior title. A lot of mouthful, but that says that patent sits silently in its own power that prevails, period. It's settled. There may be an act of ejectment, but it's only, you don't come in on the, you don't try to argue someone's weaker title. In fact, you'll see as we read through this, if you read through this farther, if even if a patent holder was silent, it, the court has no power to interfere. And so you're coming with the strength of your own title. This is just an equity principle. There's nothing new here I learned. Again, this case was all the stuff I've ever learned wrapped in this little bitty case in equity principles, which I found why it was such important to talk to you about. Because where we don't have information and you get the records or you go, you start doing, you start interfering with the establishment of the of the United States of America in its records, you're touching the very foundation of your ability to exist as a society and the very foundation of why you have the right to live in your house without an interference. Notwithstanding that you don't agree, you haven't enjoyed that, but that's another problem. But here's, here's the old law that works right up front today, the principles of which work right front, and I'll point out some things that are in sta a statute. I've already talked to you about all this. That, that reflect this as well. Moving on, moving through here, you uh, an act of ejectment can happen by state law, but it's not going to uh, divest the power of a patent, the evidence power of the patent. The case uh, was submitted and printed arguments by Mr. Stillwell for the plaintiff in error and uh, Mr. Hempstead for the defendant. The Stillwell's uh, first point was that can the plaintiffs claiming under a grant of preemption recover against the defendant claiming under the patent? issued subsequent to the preemption. We respectfully submit that by the act of uh, Congress of 29th May 1830, the new uh, Northwest Fraction Quarter Section 21 North 12 West was appropriate to the to the use of the occupant, Nathan Cloes, was not subject to grant to any other person by Congress or any other officer of the United States until the expiration of the time allowed him to make payment, therefore, by the act of the, uh, the act of July 5th, 1832, it was appearing on the payment what was made by his heirs with time the patent was void. And then they list a bunch of things you go off, uh, you can go read through. The pat a preemption uh, is a legal vested right. The patent in in issued uh, to co Gov Pope being void as issued without authority may be impeached in a court of law. Remember, we've got equity going on here. These little statements here you got to go through and understand and qualify. Under the statute of Arkansas, the patent certificate is equal grade and dignity to the patent itself. That's those state certificates if they're issued and through, uh, and is better title than a patent founded on a subsequent entry within the meaning of, of the statute. And the patent was not, uh, could not affect the pre-existing title of the ancestor of the plaintiffs. You hear all these statements. It almost sounds like it's going against the one with the patent. But if you go read what they're about, you find out that it can't. An extraneous evidence was admissible to show the patent was void and for want of authority to issue it. Now you got to have to understand what they just tried to do there. 
They tried to enter evidence of the void, and you can do it void, but you can't do it in a court of law. So you have to understand your jurisdictions here. And then that, that challenge can only be done for facial fraud. And so if you don't understand your rights and your titles and what this all means, what I've been talking to you for, for years, trying to get people strong again in their property to get a sense of what they really have to them, because there's things that come from the land that are not just phrases, they're actual things that come with the land, that this court is saying prevail against a challenge. And that would include the state, which is going to underline this, which you're not going to hear, but that's what underlies the problem. The state courts, a judge has no power to interfere. The jurisdiction of the judge has no power to interfere with the solemn acts of a government. To you, which is the patent evidence. Going on here, the title of uh, plaintiffs related to the date of Preemption Act 29 May 30, the making of proof of occupation and cultivation and the adjudication of the right by the land office and the payment of the purchase money were successive steps to perfect the right and are to be regarded as having been done on that day. That's actually how you do an entry going to patent. You then have a receipt. This is the receiver they're talking about going to receive the payment, but that has to be a land that you can claim and a prior right will not allow you to enter. It's just like in mining. You can't come in. If a miner sits there with his claim, you can't come in on that land. To the, and what I just said is contrary to all the mining law experts, you'll probably ever hear that call themselves mining law experts because they haven't read this stuff. Well, they listen to me, and they're using my information, but they're, they've, abor they've uh, contorted it to make them sound important. So for those of you that are miners that are listening, be careful on who you listen to out there. They're claiming knowledge that they don't have. They literally are talking information that I've I've given years ago, but it got contorted over the time. And they want to be an expert. What I'm asking you to do is you be the expert. Take what I'm saying as a lead, and then move forward to, with your own research and become strong in that for yourself. So they're saying that the purchase money and doing all the things before to the uh, land office receiving an application wasn't better title. After doing all that, it wasn't better title. Why? Because the patent disposed the land to someone and it was a solemn order without without a fraud on its face. So let's I'll just give that answer to you quick so you understand what I'm just reading through. You sounds like when you read this, maybe maybe the plaintiff had a right, but, but they don't. This is the whole point. There's nothing that comes against these patents. They're not something you make again. I got lots of people thinking that you got to go make this up. It's already in the land office. It's already in print. It's in black and white. You get a certified copy of it. You start your chain to there. That's where you, your origins are for the land. Moving on to just read through. When the patent was issued, the land was had been appropriated and was not subject to grant, and it ought to have been excluded by the circuit court or the jury instructed to disregard it as the plaintiffs asked. The act of issuing it was mere, a mere ministerial act, and as to the rights of the plaintiffs' ancestors, wholly ineffectual to prejudice them. A lot of words, a lot of different thought here, I suppose, to most people, but this is the law of your land. This is what gives you the power that you start from. This is the very thing that your current statutes and your current courts are violating that they have no power of. And this is where we got to this case when I was asking my colleague what has happened recently. And just to maybe get punch, do the punchline here to that, the judge looked at the case after being told of the handed the patent to a chain of title, and then told of the Hooper case, the judge came up with the right answer against a foreclosure. And don't go running off like you can do this for the when you hear me say this. You have to build the case right, and you have to know what to say. You'll learn that real quick once you see this. The judge gave the right answer. I don't have jurisdiction to counter a patent. I do not have the power to undermine the patent. The only power that I have as a judge is to affirm it. And in that case, the, the mortgagee, uh, mortgagor, I guess it is, uh, the attorney anyway, had no power. And almost got himself in a lot of trouble for trying to insist that it didn't exist. It, wasn't, it was old law and didn't work no more. And so, uh, maybe I should just stop there because that's the punchline. You read through this case, you read through this law, you find out your patents are important. Why is that important for me to tell you? Because that's objective basis. That's the black and white for your land. The law is what you are bringing to court. The fact of the law that underpinned that fact is also what you're bringing. 
the obligations and duties that not even a court can touch. Where did I tell you before on that? If you go to the, uh, I guess it's uh, Oregon Statute ORS 12040, you see right there it says that a jurisdiction of the courts could not affect a patent. It's even in statute. So when I'm talking law of the law, when I'm talking from substantial things, the subtlety that I talk to that I think pe most people miss is I'm not talking opinion. I've already st established a record evidence of the condition before we move forward. I anticipate that's been done as well. And this it's gotten me to where I think I, I believe someone knows about what's going on and I assume they've done the basics. It's come back to nip me. I can't say bite me, but nip me when I found out they actually didn't. And then we had fast work to do to build the record. I've told you it's all about that record. Build the record uh, more, more perfect if we can and to present the right statement that wasn't actually done. In fact, a lot of times I'm talking with people, it's to step back and say, okay, well, we have some more preliminary work to do before we get to where you want to go. And so this, this anyway, this case is critical. This is a great case. It really lines it up. It, it kind of nutshells the whole thing for me, uh, for you to tell you. These are all the principles that I've been, uh, that are in equity. I actually learned them from equity. This case wraps it up, but it does it even before the mining loan, which is where I started to actually apply. So I say, you can have knowledge, but how do you apply it? I apply it totally different than anybody else I know. Not that I'm supposed to be so different. We're supposed to be doing it the way we're supposed to be doing it. But there's not many people that apply it the way I, I know to do it that get themselves in trouble relative to law. When they start to do their own opinions and they go like patriot stuff and all that, their case starts to lose its, its uh, vigor. Because why? The very first evidence is the patent. That says it. I just mentioned, when you read this, you'll see if you really apply this, not even if the patent is silent, it has power, and and that says something. You have to think about how do you how do you apply the dynamics in these cases. I deal in the dynamics. That means the judge had to go do preliminary research himself or herself to go see the record, official record. Now I've never heard that done, but that's what's supposed to be done. The the judge is supposed to do the law on the facts. Public records are public notice. They're supposed to be taken judicial notice. We don't enjoy any of this discussion in our so-called opinions we get anymore. And so this is why I say you have to put the more complete case forward. So I'm going to move here, move on, move into something. What is so important that's going on? This is 1859. What's happening in the news today to divest us of this very big power? If I'm going to didn't say it clear enough, let me say, your right of ingress and egress is attached to a patent that was granted on a land that you're standing on. What's your right of ingress and egress? Some fancy word, yeah, from the past, it seems, because they don't want to use that word, that phrase today. These are pertinent rights for your coming and going from the property given and granted that is to prevail against every other authority. No, your lawful use, I have to say, this is not to be used for the crime, you know, perpetrate crime for the use of the property. That's not what it was granted for. Let's get past all that nonsense and let's look at, you're granted a property, you're on a property. It was disposed for a use. And that use had a, a right to access, ingress and egress. Not your right to travel. Not your right to drive. And so I've adjusted my terminology and then I went to what? I didn't go to the Motor Vehicle Code. It has nothing to do with land law. It has nothing to do with appurtenant rights to the grants. And so we go to the road law. What was the road law de determined in the state? And I found that they're pretty consistent with recognizing these grants. And so, not moving over there too far, if you don't understand the law of the land, you don't understand how to then suggest at least very strongly the courts don't have jurisdiction over that appurtenant right and therefore you bring yourself subject to some other statutory uh, interpretation a mischaracterization the mischaracterization on that is a fraud that's a felony in the judge and uh, you don't get angry you just say point start pointing out you can do it ahead of time if the court were to do uh, inter interfere then it's going to be moving itself into 
mischaracterizing the property, which is a color of law, which is unwarranted, without title, and you're handing my property to the state itself. That's a felony, multiple felonies. I've talked to you about this before. So it's not like, this is not news. It's all coming from this old, old case, if you will, come if I could say it's coming from there. It's not really, not from what, how I learned it. I had to go all kinds of places to learn it. But now I understand when I read these cases more where I was reading the authorities, where, why do you see what's going on? And that, that's just a more comprehensive knowledge so that I'm finding that's important so that when you get brought into a, a, a bunch of, a den of thieves, you can handle it. You can contain them because you understand really what the base, the foundation of what you're talking about is, and you understand that they're not supposed to be violating it, and you understand when they do, it is a problem. As I've told you, uh, got a couple cases, they just sit there, the, the, there's such an injustice at this point that you throw in, instead of going after a traffic ticket, as a traffic ticket, I said you do your you do your set asides if you can, but even better, I think, and I've done it, so it's not I think, uh, you move an injunction, you move again into a court of equity. It's called chancery, and you challenge that the government had had no authority to in to encroach, infringe upon your vested right of ingress and egress, a pertinent the patent. And so you have a collateral attack. Remember what you heard in this case? I even read enough there. These cases are not supposed to be at law. They have to be in an equity court. And so your collateral attack is in an equity court, challenging that their statutory impositions are a violation. And I would add, not only is it not supposed to happen, they're in breach of their oath and duty to protect and secure that in you through where? For those of you who have been listening to me, should be kind of right around the Right off your lips, quickly, your enabling acts of every state provide this this uh, obligation and duty, and that gets us back into where? Well, okay, we go on and on. I'm not gonna. I won't go too deep. The disposal from Congress as a supreme act that overrides and was requested by the state itself in its enabling clause for the disposal of the land, and the reason for that, and this has been lost as well is that this, the people of the time understood they didn't want the state to hold the titles and give them because there could have been a silent rem, a rem, remainder of authority of some sort of a jurisdiction. And so they said, no, let's give it all to Congress, and Congress will dispose it. So when it comes from Congress, we, we have a better idea that it's separate. The federal authority is separate from the state authority. When they convey the title, there's a chasm of separation. We know there will be no remaining interest, not even a state remaining interest. Now, if that's the case, and since that is the case, in this case, this this issue, this Hooper case tells us this: How is it that the property can be taxed? How is the property can be regulated? When I tell you the act, it comes in 1866. It says the Congress granted the disposal of the highways to be upon their construction with no other regulation. Where did the state have the right to alter that simple grant? Is what I'm telling you is about the aggressive ingress and egress that came a pertinent that's not regulable that way. Anyway, we'll move on. Okay, so what's under threat? It's this transformation of our society. It's we're moving from that foundation of law into bureaucrats, technocrats, technocrats. You have all these words, sustainable You're developing all this stuff, and we're seeing it more coming into vogue, and this is how the plan was, and this little article is interesting, I've told you, look at the tabs, all of a sudden news comes together, it's like packaged, if you look at it, just, if you know what to look for. This little story pop up, and shows us where, and is COVID's involved, everything that we're seeing today, why we don't see our rights, why the judges are not giving us the law, because we don't assert it back properly, and they take advantage of that. They're not supposed to, but they are. I can't talk about that, I don't know, nothing more I can say about criminals being in robes. I didn't ask for that. I would just assume that they don't. They didn't, but they didn't even do that. They wanted to see if they can get away with this. Why? How do we know that? We know that they're providing for promotions and where they get away with it for sustainable development, climate change, all this other stuff. Okay, it's an international body of usurpers in our gates. I find this, the, the silence on this is just deafening and scarier than heck. But at any rate, few few people are stepping up. And this story, Cultural Marxism Origins, how the disciples of the obscure of an obscure Italian linguist subverted America. Let me read the very first part, just 
to get you into it because it'll touch. The, some of you have done the research on this, and it's important to know that it comes from this, but it's something a little different as well. And you can, when you read through about how it's being done, you'll realize what I've been saying and how it's not an opinion. When you watch society degrade before your eyes, there's been an, an, a cancer in it the whole time. You're not just solving for the problems that you're seeing you, you, or the underlying con condition, the, um, the things that you're not enjoying that the law says. You're having to deal with a cancer that's in people. It's in everybody to different levels. And so we got to be, that's why I said, I don't want to get into isms of this, because that's that's how they drive your thoughts. But let me read here just quickly to introduce it. You may have heard of the terms cultural Marxism, critical theory, and Frankfurt School bantied about. And while you might have an intuitive approximation of what these terms mean in America in the 21st century, there is a good chance that you don't know much about the deep theory, where the ideology comes from, and what it has planned for America and the world. Very interesting opening paragraph. Um, I don't have the time to really read all of this. Let me go back up to the ideology. This whole thing, and this is, I'm going to be, again, like resist isn't just the word. The new thing that people are promoting, the reset, is not actually a reset. And I'm a little agitated, but I won't get too far off. It's just not for me to do much of that anyway. Everybody wants to say there's a reset. Folks, they're not doing a reset. They're talking reset. But remember, words mean something else. When you're in a system, a global system of transformation, you're not going to get a reset. You'll think it's a reset. They're prepping your mind for the switch. But they've undermined your ideology, your cultural identity, if you want to be, if you will. Even those that resist this are being brought in because you're not resisting it properly. You're being going in with the tide. You're like floating on a boat with the tide coming in. You're not really doing counter to that. In fact, you, you shouldn't have been in the boat in the first place. But at any rate, so this, the ideological problem is the cultural problem. That's what this Gram, um, Gramsci talked to. He's one of those guys that kind of looked at things and and started to look at a, the, the cultural Marxism as a difference thing, where I think Marxism was like economy and things. Gramsci, Gramsci said, no, this is about culture. You change the culture of a people, you will transform them. Now, why did I bring up the, the patent stuff? Well, because they're trying to transform you out of your basic law of the land, outside of your property. In the new transformation, you have no property, not even yourself. What, this came interesting because it's starting to show us, for me to tell you, there's another observation, if you want to read it, how they take terminology, how they get your feelings to move, how they get it shifted, and how they use that over time in order to transform your society. The people in the future will not even know. It's like the frogs in boiling water syndrome. They don't even know they've been cooked. And this is what we're seeing today. The COVID is another one of those examples to do that, where they use, we're now finding out, it was nothing to do with COVID. It's all been, always been about transforming your society to accept uh, sustainable development. And the Bar Association has been right there to allow it. They've never stepped up in their independent, inherent power to shut down things that went wrong on the executive side for these governors. And so it's important to understand, I don't want to get too lost in understanding the dynamic the detaily dynamics. You have to understand an overview. This article, I think, provides it. That came up, uh, interestingly, right before somebody posts on the Twitter a thing, what's going, what on earth is going on? And then they highlight in pictures this phrase, build back better. Wherever you look, Biden's involved, uh, Bohr, uh, Johnson's involved in UK, Canada, build back better. You see it in uh, news articles. Prime Ministers of all over the place. I'm just looking up. OECD, I even responded to that organization. Build Building Back Better from Australia. All right, so what is that? This is the ongoing promotion, transform, culturally moving you uh, people into a new place. And eventually, when you, when you understand the dynamic of popular vote, you'll end this direct democracy nonsense, you'll realize how they're doing it as well. Gramsci said if you can get a culture to move across the tra transfer the culture in their in the pe what people accept 
get them to abandon, buy into new things and abandon old things, then you're going to be able to shift societies and transform them. What's going on in the Great Reset is not a reset. A reset would say we're going back and starting over from the beginning. We're going to reset. I go to my, my computer. It goes screwy. I push reset. Correct? And when it turns on, I got my same old thing going. Right? This is not a reset. They want you to think it's a reset. Then it's in your mind what the reset is, as you've culturally been adjusted. Or not. It doesn't matter. So this is not a reset. This is a transformation, and we're on the cusp of that going on. And I don't know, this COVID, I would expect it a lot more people to step up, but they're not, and so I'm really concerned here. But, okay, get back to the Build Back Better. This was a, I got a couple of links to talk about it. Build Back Better Principles for Reconstruction. It was a discussion written in 2014. You go through it and find out about Build Back Better. These are slogans. These are slogans to make you think that something's going on and that you should you can buy into it and you should support it and you you know if you don't why why don't you want to build back better? What they're not telling you is what they're building back better to. And so we have to learn we're all the time we're looking at TV. There's these slogans going on. They may be tied to something. Likely they are anymore. And here we have this concept that I thought was fascinating after coming from the Gramsci's article and the uh, culture of Marxism, the spinoff from that and what we're actually doing. It's similar to uh, Bernays. Uh, Bernays had the same kind of a thing going. You, the, so you've got to be careful of how to be, you're being deceived. I don't want to get lost. I want to keep moving. I, gotta, I want to get to something really important about what you can continue to do for yourself. But Build Back Better is a slogan. I found this fascinating because this is what they were talking about, like in the Gramsci article, just came like a week before that. We can read in this, a big ba bring, Build Back Better is this slogan. It's not really new to us today. It's, it, it came out for almost a, uh, over a decade ago. It was, but it was tied before that to this very same nonsense, and we'll see it right here, uh, that we talk about, it says sustainable development, the promotion, all that. It says right here in this paper, the introduction, build back better. Quote, the, the phrase signifies an ideal reconstruction and recovery process that delivers resilient, sustainable, and efficient recovery solutions to, to disaster-affected communities. Are you a disaster-affected community today under COVID-19? Then this article is written for you. And it doesn't mean you good, but here it is if you want to understand. The motivation behind the Build Back Better concept is the, to make uh, communities stronger, community stronger, not you. Communitarianism. Community stronger and more resilient, in other words, to protect themselves, the community, from you, uh, following a disaster event. Has COVID-19 been a disaster, folks? Statistics from the United Nations Environment Program in 2008 show an increase in the number of natural disasters over time attributed to growth, growing populations, urban growth in a risk-prone areas due to scarcity of land and global warming. Along with the increasing frequency, recent disasters show an increase of magnitude and re resulting destruction according to the studies by the Red Cross. You need to study what the Red Cross is actually, folks. It's not the uh, nurses in Red Cross white smock thing that you think it is, uh, but, but uh, both uh, b both the natural and technological man-made disasters have seen nearly exponential rise in the number of disasters over time. You think there's been a lot of man-made disasters? In fact, that little petition I'm going to talk about here, if I get, I hope I get there, got to get there, it says the very same thing. This is a man-made disaster. So they're talking, Belt Back Better is relevant to uh, manipulating societies during times of disaster, and I don't know why we don't see COVID-19 as that disaster. Let me move down. I don't want to read more. I just see, well, who started this? The phrase, building back better, again, it can be just this little thing that's up in the corner of a screen or behind somebody or on a, on a banner. It's just anywhere. They just keep throwing these things up. They've been doing it for years, and it comes all relevant again today if we want to know it, and it to me, it's relevant because it's something we didn't talk about in the petition I'm going to talk about, but because we didn't have the facts to connect it in the time. But it sits there. It sits there like a little cancer that you could use if you want to. You don't have to, but I'm just saying there is a way to tie all this together, and it's not, it's not an opinion. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's, it's, an, it's an attack. It's an organized attack. 
It's, it's the organized criminal syndicates have gotten together, again, knowing you better than yourself, knowing how imperceptive we are on lots of things, how programmable we are. The program up here, what they talk about? There was the program, right? United Nations programming. And so what do we have? That is the phrase, building back better, became popular during the large-scale reconstruction effort following the Indian Ocean tsunami disaster in 2004, after which it became more officially embraced with creation of the sets of BBB guidelines to steer recovery and reconstruction activities toward achieving this goal, attributed to Clinton, William J. in 2006. Yeah, that Clinton. No, the well, the one that wears the dress. You didn't think this is long-term internal systemic cancer in the United States or globally. I don't know what more to say to you. So this is where this phrase is coming from. It is building into the sustainable development model. It's everywhere. You look around, and I just found fascinating that someone put it all together. They see it. They put it together. Okay, maybe it's time to talk about it. It's in people's face now. It won't listen behind the woodshed too much, but it's there. We can point it out. Then we said, what's building back better? What does this have to do with? And at the time, 2006, Banda Aceh was what they're talking about. The earthquake that literally shook the earth and literally changed the theory. And it wasn't a theory. It was a working model I had relative to earthquakes, relative to actually subsequent earthquakes, being able to predict the second of earthquake responding to a first. When Banda Aceh hit, that model, that, that anticipation stopped. The earth changed at that time. These folks were right there to pick up, and we're going to make this a, a marketing tool. Building back better for them, the world we want. Did they ask you? No. has nothing to do with you. Man-made disasters? Is that COVID? Absolutely, because there's no test to prove it's natural. And we have evidence that it's, even if we give it something, it looks like it might be man-made which I don't agree with any of that. I think it's ma it's been made up. No one did the local checks to, to be able to test for it, and we just took it on hearsay that there was something going on, and you watch the world turn off. Fascinating. Building back better. Sustainable mental health care after emergencies. World Health Organization. The same brokers of uh, Pharma Harma that don't care about you and uh, toggle themselves back and forth on whatever political whim gets you to believe that they've got an authority, have been written in uh, through the uh, organizations to be appropriate medical experts. And we see the world get locked down, notwithstanding that wasn't supposed to happen. How did that happen? I don't know. So we have sustainable mental health care. That's going to be, to me, that read more like you're going to put you in a, if you don't agree with what they say, they're going to put you in re reconstruction, retraining camps. This is the, the way that they're going to work. That They focus right on that. Now, I want to move over to, well, how does that matter? Okay, the who, the WHO, not the rock group or the owl. How does that, how is that relevant to the United States or anything local or anybody or any organization? Well, why don't we go look real quick? And what did I talk to you about before? In the United States, relative to the WHO and the programs that were put on by the WHO. And we talked about One Health, didn't we? Okay, real quick, we go to the One Health Commission. <laughs> the Internet, all this stuff's available. Type in Building Back Better. Go look for it. In June 4th, video Building Back Better, taking, one, taking a One Health approach for healthy landscapes People, animals, and wildlife. Landscapes are not watersheds. Remember that. Landscapes is another obfuscation term that has nothing to do with what you think it is. It has nothing to do with the terrain outside. They're dealing with people, animals, and uh, wildlife. Building back better, June 4th, they're talking about this. All right? One Health. What did I talk about One Health before? I told you. One Health was part of this uh, of the CDC. It's already been in place for a, quite a long time. Building Back Better, Take a One Health Approach to Healthy Landscapes, People, Animal, Wildlife was a quote hosted by the United States Nation, Nation, United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, and the International Livestock Research Institute. Yeah, animals. 
and you go through and you look back, uh, building back better, and you look and see what is involved, who's involved, and you start to be able to identify this has been around for a little while. They're just employ employing it. They're employing it for COVID. The world's largest agricultural research network launches COVID hub, 19 hub to support global scientific response. No science whatsoever. It's best science. It's BS. Uh, one of this, the June 23rd, the priority area aimed to address the potential impacts of the pandemic on poverty, hunger, and nutrition, as well as by taking the opportunity to build back better for a healthier, more sustainable future. It's not a future you want. It's the sustainable future. This is all tied together with the CDC, promoting an agenda through COVID. Sustainable development. We'll go down to June 22nd. They go on and on. I don't know if I how much more. One Health is tied to this thing. They even talk about it. If I just pass by it, we go down to COVID-19 is the tip of the syndemic. Last week, I did not read that word. It's in the broadcaster link. I think the last one I added. I don't think I mentioned it. Syndemic was a new twist of a word they're putting. All this is tied together. Everything you're being fed. Oh no! Don't go attack. Go attack Assange. Don't let the don't let the people take the uh, prime the emergency responders take pictures of the of the of the disaster so we can figure out what might have helped to protect us. No, don't let have the, all the good information out. No, we're going to start force feeding this nonsense through different ways and through different promotions. And all these so-called authorities who are sitting in the called considered appropriate are feed, force feeding all this stuff to you without you even understanding it. It's all integrated. It's all connected, right? Grimner? Circle? All connected. But behind a woodshed, we connect it, and then we say what? We say, okay, is that relevant to what I need to address? It may not be, and it may be. Relative to COVID, absolutely can be. And here we move on now to the case that I told you was filed. We now have evidence that was served. I now know that. I can tell you it's still in the preliminary check, uh, uh, preliminary steps. Uh, that uh, Here's a going on to the next link. Tullis sues a CV-19 pseudocrisis, says Lee Edix. Lee Edicts, excuse me, kudzu smothering local economy. This is from the TELUS report. Now, the gentleman that filed the filed the lawsuit is David TELUS. So he is a journalist and a broadcaster. And that's, uh, and I have a link to the lawsuit as well. I would have never thought about it being kudzu smothering, but I guess that's what you think about in the South-ish, isn't it? Vine. Is that, uh, you're, you're close by over there. At any rate, pretty funny uh, at that level. But serious stuff here. Why do I even bring this up? Why did this lawsuit re even come to the top? It's because it, it does more of what I've been telling you needed to be done that no other attorney across the nation has ever done. That is how we, uh, I can't see how else you would ad address the problem. The Governor Lee is the one that has been doing in Tennessee the emergency orders. They have a, they have a, their health professionals are making the same thing that they're doing everywhere. It's by the same model. What I want to offer to you today, and without getting too much in the discussion yet, I want to see more come from this before we get more deeply into it. But it's so important, and it's happening right now against you all that some people apparently don't know what really they how to address it. They need some help. This petition was agreed to be a model of sorts. And so why it's why I'm gonna even talk about it yet before we even get moving through it. There is a link on the will be on the link on the on the blogcaster for it. It's a Chancery Court of Hamilton County, Tennessee. It cites Bill Lee and Rebecca Barnes uh, the two par parties with orders, health orders, uh, utilizing COVID-19 or the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the, it's a petition in equity and for writ of mandamus. Remember, I said the Ohio case didn't look like it was an equity case with a jury. We found out in the beginning of the broadcast talking about patents that when you see that judge talk about how you do not submit solemn acts of the of the government to the people, 
uh, for all their intelligence or, or, or lack thereof. You cannot do these things and put them over to a court of law. Equity is the only jurisdiction that is viable. This case is filed in an equity jurisdiction, a chancery jurisdiction. What I want to point out here when you get to this, uh, when you get the link, is for... We, I talked about the, the sustainable development. We talked about the bar. This petition, in only 30 or so pages, a little bit extra with the beginnings and the endings for service and things, this touches a lot of what I just talked about, but it doesn't touch what I talked about because this case didn't have the elements or needed the facts to bring in what I talked about, let's say, like building back again. We already addressed sustainable development in a different way in the petition. For those of you that are interested and you are wanting to know how to address this and you're looking for an example, I'm going to offer this to you now, and I want you to pay attention specifically for the ones that want to do habeas, because this is pretty broad spectrum, even within 30 pages. You can choose what you want, essentially, and I wouldn't choose more than you're able to deal with. But for those that are writing a habeas, I want you to consider the first about eight pages. You need to not copy and paste. What you need to do is understand what's being said. You need to conform the facts that are in the first eight pages with your facts. There is a statement in the middle of what the, what the officials did not do. It was relating to a letter that was a letter of demand. I've told you to write to get the ba answer back. It happened to be five points. The letter, I don't know if the letter's involved, I don't think the letter's attached to this file. Those that don't have that uh, that letter, when you read the petition, and I don't remember which pages are there, it states in number four or five, five or six different ways that the county did not do something. That is the restatement of the letter demands to produce evidence for those things. Those of you that are interested to write a habeas, you would convert, you would Convert that part to a letter demand for evidence for each one of those points where your statute says that. you got to go find your first statute. This whole petition is based in one statute failure, one code failure, and even not even the whole code. This is not that complicated, actually. The, the habeas corpus people can use the first eight and replicate what's been done there for you. Go get make your demand, get your answer that it's not there. They'll tell you that it's PCR. They'll tell you that they did whatever they did. They won't provide the evidence of the things that you asked for. You come back in, in your habeas, you say they did not do this evidence. They did not produce this evidence. They did not produce. And this statute required that they do that. My, There is no warrant. There's no lawful warrant for the restraint that they've put on me. Is your habeas claim built into this writ of mandamus and inequity? Why? Because the writs are going to speak to the same thing. Why this is going to be a bit of a model. Rule of law and democracy says that this style of petition, or close to it, will be global in its application. You just have to apply your local rules, your local law, statute, or code. You certainly have to do your local facts, and you have to do your own local evidence building, which is the letter demand for the evidence. You have to do a little bit of thinking in this. It's not that hard, and it's not that difficult to figure out what you think you need to do, even if you don't have all the paperwork for the filing. And that's really the only reason why I want to talk to you about it already. I know it's been filed. I know it's served. And I know that I know what this thing does. You're going to read past eight. It's the Everything past eight is uh, an anticipation of defenses that you've watched the governors do across the nation. That is not necessary for the habeas. You could, but it's not necessary. For everyone that wants to trim this down, I, I, I'm really focused on this for you all because you each have to step up and each can. The more that you do, the more pressure you're putting on the system to get it right. And the more evidence we would then have to see how are they doing it wrong to still do it, to make it look like they're right, and how are we going to pl how are we going to stop that in them? Because this thing literally is global, and everywhere there's rule of law and democracy has treated it the same way, which means we have the same problem there, but that's the Achilles heel. This is the thing I partly get excited about. The thing that is so encompassing is also 
a weakness. And we have the ability right now to exploit the weakness without getting too esoteric here. Go back to the, when you get the petition, go back and listen to what I'm saying. Read the whole whole thing. See what it does. Get to the demand at the end. You want to see what this equity demand can do. This isn't even all of it. This is just what fit the facts. This is likely shouldn't suffer mutinance, even if the governor still uh, lifts the orders. There's still two things that aren't, left, aren't fixed when they do that. So understand to read this. If you those of you that have been in legal and you know this stuff in law and writing paper, well, mark on the beats that you wrote on mail.com. I'll be listening for some critiques. I'll tell you that. So far, so good. A colleague of mine looked at this and actually told me the major points of the first eight pages before I before I even asked him. I felt fairly confident that they then were communicating those points. Is the most important point. Does it communicate what it's supposed to say? Is it sitting in the law with the facts as they are? Can you see, when you go to the statute, that there is a statute that does impose the duty and they failed? Does it state that? That is what you need for a habeas. That, that proves that what they're doing to you to lock you down makes what they're done to, in, uh, to restrain your liberty. And your liberty now becomes... Everything that your life is, I say liberty interest as you would see legal. It's those ingresses and egresses. It's your unfettered interaction with people. It's now being in the world and watching the, the scowls come back at you. You're free from, you should have been free from that. That's been a harm to you. The cops engaging you, anybody engaging you, that you should have been free from the association of that is written into this petition as an example. Your Examples, your harms may be different. They may be more. Don't limit yourself as well. But anyway, I don't know what, I don't want to go into the analysis of this. I hope you find favor in it. I hope you find it's a model that you can use. I know it is. It's whether or not you'll use it and it'll start you at least give you, I told you I'd give you a path. This is almost paving the way. And until I have some minds that can come together, not just minds.com, but the rest of you too. That will show me the the problems. I'm going to have to say this is the best attempt that I've seen in the nation, literally, in addressing this thing in the proper jurisdiction, in the proper way. And David Tullis is taking the he's taking the spear point now. It's essentially a baton, and that that he's going to take and drive this because he wants to see this thing stop in Tennessee. In particular, that county, because that's the jurisdiction of the county, but the judge is a state judge. We can move it out from there because of the harm that's done over the state. And I want to thank, as I thought, thank everybody that's been helping to move that forward. I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know the opposition it's going to get. I can tell you, when you look at it and you think about what it's saying and how it gets at it and how simple it is, you... Well, I would hope you find favor enough that you get excited to make your own. And I think the habeas is the is the fastest way to add it. I don't know how this is anywhere uh, makes it anywhere. We don't have to get as complicated to do this. So anyway, there's a model. There's an example. You have to apply your facts. You have to apply your state statute. You have to do your part to make it yours. But here's a guide. Here's the the thing that I think that works. It's been through quite a few eyeballs to see it before it got filed. And I, I think it's I think it's going to stand the test. Whether or not it sees justice, that's not really my focus right now. Those people in Melbourne, Australia, in Australia, and everyone getting beat down, you need to look at this document. You need to see to start at least break your writer's block to get something written. Start protecting yourself. And if I have it wrong, fix it. Figure out where it's wrong and fix it. This is not that far off than, that you that if there is a problem, that it can't be adjusted for you. Again, if I've made a mistake in telling you this, you have the opportunity to find and fix that that maybe I'm blind to, or a, a many number of other people are blind to. This was started out as a model for you all, and it, it has a function, and I'm certainly hoping it moves forward and does what it's supposed to do. But for for not having anybody step up otherwise, and having lots of excuses, I I'm not a, I guess I just want to make sure that 
People were given every tool they could ever get to move forward to protect themselves and get back to, instead of, instead of building back better, no, let's just get back to the foundation of the law that was supposed to protect us, that we have allowed all these politicians to avoid, evade, actually. And never said, said to peep one that a petition like what David Tullis has filed is at least, at least better than being crickets. And if it's nothing more than that, then we're back to the peanut gallery, and that's good, too, what I talked about Julian Assange. Enough crickets stop making, start making noise, stop cricketing, stop making chirping, and actually start to become active in the forest. Scares the devil out of these people. Maybe that's what we need. But to remain crickets is not going to be the answer. I think Jonathan... Excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> I thank uh, David Tullis for taking up the gauntlet to do this and uh, stepping forward to, at least my estimation is it's the most proper way to advance this. I haven't had an example myself to see how it would be done better. And thank you to all that support him. And uh, David is a broadcaster in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So you can listen to him if you want to. I understand he gets... You know, the listenership on this kind of information is probably similar across the nation. But he's got a lot of dedicated people that listen. You can listen. You can help. You can promote the point. I've been just almost shocked at how little coverage the Tennessee lawsuit did over, but didn't get relative to the Ohio one and relative to the other ones. When all the other ones agreed that COVID was something. This petition goes through in very short order and tells you, all the proofs that show that they cannot do what they're doing. They have not done what they were required to do. This is not an opinion. This is not fraud, just jumping down, uh, jumping onto an official. This is saying there was a black and white objective basis to follow that they were derelict to do. Now, I'm not going to get all to the legalness. You'll see that in the petition in various fra uh, frames that this thing is a massive violation to our way of life. And you see, when I talk about a transformation, it's not going to be a reset. You see the cancer metastasizing in every governor, in every public health official, in the CDC, in the WHO. You watch this thing. It's a cultural thing in our nation that's going to take us down, like Gramsci said, has to happen over time. If folks aren't putting this together, there, I just said it. I've been saying it. And so how do you stop it? I'm not maybe the best guy to go ask to all, on, on all seeing eye for sure, but I found out if you focus in on the law, it's the thing that they're trying to get you to move from. The new normal is no basis in law, no property, no rights, no due process required. The law require in the United States anywhere, and normally we're due uh, the rule o law and democracy brand of professional usurpation exists. Due process is required. And it's a certain due process. Notice opportunity, time, and place in its most basic form. The notice of something's going on, the opportunity to respond, the time to respond, and a place to do so. And when they failed to give you the first notice, when they were ordered to do so by the legislature, they violated you all. Now the harder problem was, um, this even happened in this, this case, what were you violated, it violated in that was going to be recognized by the oppressor? And the only way I know to do that is go back to the law, go back to the foundation, go back to the fundamentals and say, there, there they are, right here, here, here. This is what I pulled together, my facts, to show I'm harmed in these ways. And you did it unwarranted. And you did it without right. And I just going to just line you out and you handed my rights to somebody else, like the cop, to keep me in. That's that's another set of felonies. I've just told you, that's a pe penal extortion and penal coercion. The property was, inviola was violated, unwarranted, or handed to a third party without right to accept it, or the rights were violated in the same fashion, by commission or omission to do. And I I'm just blown away how much power we have as people to be actually declared the victimization without being victims. And we, I hear, I've been hearing crickets. And to that, David, thank you very much for stepping up.
uh, again, again, I don't know what more to say uh, about that. Stepping up is so important. And not to disregard a couple more of you all that are were talking on the emails. And I had a little bit of rough couple days getting ready for a surprise rain, so I haven't been able to get back to you. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'm I'm not I haven't forgot you. I just I have some pressing things. But getting back to this, what's mo- more important is uh, getting you to stop be sitting silent without without a, a remedy. Just thinking you can just say resist, resist. There is a thing to do. And I think, again, this is going to be a model, if you'll accept it, conform it to yours and learn a bit about your what, what's required for whatever remedy you want. I'm kind of pressing for people the habeas because that's private to each one of you. A writ of mandamus is in relation to someone who witnesses the harm and within the standards of an equity jurisdiction advances the cause for the whole state. It's a little higher level than what most people would be um, able to do or understand to do. And so I really haven't pushed those. And there, they, and you'll see when you get to the demand, there, there may be stuff you've never heard of that's there and available. Will that happen? Well, we don't know. That's the about to the judge, but you know what? You're there suggesting and asserting your rights, aren't you? And when you know a little bit more and you realize that stuff is there for a court to do that means justice and they won't do it, you got another criminal, don't you? Pretty simple. I don't mean that on your opinion that they don't give you. Maybe they have a good reason why you didn't quite do it. We'll have to be listening for that. But where the obligation is on the do, is the obligation and duty and burden is on the government to show. Your, your request, reasonable request should at least have an explanation or be granted. And remember in the equity case, and these are just equity principles. If you read books on equity, you you, you pick this up. No different than that court case that I talked to, a Hooper case. All the principles sitting right there. If you just go through them, you'll see see equity speaking. Things that are judge facts, the judge applies a law to keep people from trespassing others, and how uh, law without, uh, a jurisdiction without where law isn't, actually, (laughs) speaks. And the principles by which it runs is what this case is is on. You don't leave this to a jury, like the Ohio case. That you bring a habeas that's more private to you. The burden is on the government in the habeas as well. The mandamus, it's on the it's on the petitioner until you show that there was the facial failure. But every and, and all these petitions, your facts they better be true. I'll just tell you, do not do not expand on the truth. Make it the true factual statement. But they're presumed true. So there's two things, two advantages you have that, that nobody that listens to me that ever went in as a defendant has ever had that you get in an equity jurisdiction given you have the facts, the title, the rights, the things you can connect to, the chain of title to your rights and your property that's being affected without warrant. Under color is the other point, right? It's under color of some legitimate thing. That's really the most heinous thing that could be doing right now. And you have it all on your side. But the habeas brings in, the burden's on them, the burden's to show why they hold you with warrant when you've just come in and destroyed everything that they could use. They have also the obligation because the burden's on them when they went to police power. I told you that was their Achilles heel. They better do this one right. What I told you also is that none of you understand really what the limits of that are. Or how to address it. And you have it. Anyway, I think I'll stop here. Please talk it up. Spread it around. Get people familiar with the case that, that David Tullis is, is uh, prosecuting here. And see if it can be, if you can, let's do the, let's do the, the, the PCR on it. Let's, let's, man, let's amplify this across the nation. Let's counter PCR with this, with this type of a petition. Learn what it's saying to, to focus you on. I want to just, I just want to focus you for those of the habeas. I think the first eight pages would be all you need. And if you can't get something, you don't use that part. It's the case, the petition's written modularly. You can use what you can use where it's all, uh, applicable. Things that are not spoken to, you may have to go find locally, but most of the, the, the journey is mapped out. And until I'm exposed to 
failures in it. I don't know what else to tell you. And I'm just, I can't, I, I don't know what to say. I want people to step up to protect themselves. I want us, I don't want us to build back better. I want us to go back to where, I want us to be in the, the dignity of our own rights as this place was left to us. And as we can see, was stated in 1859 to be the law. And you're not dealing in someone else's opinion like a jury. You're dealing on those facts. You're always dealing in your own facts, truthfully stated, presumed truthfully stated, being a, being a one with integrity and virtue, the real virtue. You, We were supposed to live in peace with that, not have it challenged at every turn. And COVID is that thing that does that, that points us to a transformation, not a reset. Breaking. We'll go through some of the things now after that petition. As I told you, the right side of history, things would come out. It's going to help fortify you. Not necessarily relevant to the petition that you'll read because that's going down a different track, but it builds a deep basket full of more proof that what the officials did when they failed to do what they were supposed to do by the statute was nothing but harmful, nothing but devastated, could come up with no right answer. Breaking, ex-Pfizer exec says pandemic is over, so-called second wave based on fraudulent testing. Well, in the petition, you better have self-evident proof it can't be used. And we do that in that petition if you look at it. And this guy is coming from the industry itself and saying exactly the same thing. I'd have to research this if I was going to go to the research. But to me, it's aside the point. It's only proof of how wrong it is. And that isn't even more relevant than what? Than the government coming in and proving beyond a reasonable doubt they did comply. That's your whole focus then. See, I don't know if you understand the dynamic. Once the burden's on them and you showed what they said, what they they haven't done that the statute said, all you have to focus on is did they bring the proof they complied? You come with the fact they showed they didn't have it by your letter, and then you cite that, and the obligation for them, the only, you don't have to get into anything more, did they bring the evidence that they complied? And if they didn't, it should be a shut door to them. You don't have to argue a thing at that point. I guess that's what maybe people don't understand. You're not going to get into an argument, actually. No, they want to do something surprising to all of us because they've never published any of this stuff and they want to produce it. Well, then you'd have an argument you didn't know. But you had a good reason why you were in there stu suing them. And now we would have the answers, wouldn't we? And that's really what we want. Why? Because what they're doing, what the admissions are, is this is a transformation of your society, not a health crisis. And if it is a health crisis, we want to know what it is that's hurting us so we might have a better a shot at protecting ourselves. And you state that inequity as well, but you want to show there's a harm for not doing it the way they did, to do it the way they did, to counter what they might come in and say, well, well, this is the best we could do. You still have to answer all these. Anyway, that petition will help guide that. So we have a someone in the industry saying there's no second wave, so-called uh, the pandemic is over. Of course it's been, but it's never been anything. And this is what I want to point out here. There's never been anything. I'm talking provable. And there never has been anything certified provable. So even buying into this story is a little bit of a, a, a deceit to yourself. All this discussion about COVID is a deceit to yourself if you keep accepting it. Nothing happened. No cause. Did, there was no cause. You can just as easy. I'm gonna do I say it, Vince? Easily. I gotta say easily. That's what that's what his name. Easily. I could just as easily say it was a bad flu season. And guess what? I forgot to mention two weeks ago. We're in another one. It's on us. Why? Because school let out in, right? I mean, they, it's, they say, oh, well, schools are not uh, super spreaders. Anybody that's ever had to raise kids knows that schools are super spreaders. Not COVID, but everything else. I mean, anything else that can happen comes out of a school in September. And so, we can play games with ourselves that we know. We send our kids in, but guess what? Little goats go to school, and guess what? For as much as it's like you don't want to deal with it, that's how they're building the strong bones and bodies. 
They're the that's the way our immune systems apparently work. Again, what doesn't make what kill what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And this is how this works. And yet they interfered with that in so many ways. We go who uh, who accidentally confirms COVID is no more dangerous than the flu. This story came out, uh, and I'm having a little bit of trouble getting to the website, so I'm going to give you a, col a secondary website through uh, blacklisted news. Doug Owen, and, uh, because I, my, I can't get to Off Guardian for some reason. But, but they go through and show that someone, uh, that the WHO uh, had a, a panel talking about uh, this COVID-19, and they claim in their couple of pieces of evidence, it sounds like it's not good, but when you think about it, it ends up being counter to what they're actually saying. But they say one comment was the rest of the world is still at risk. Well, if that's the case, that means it didn't go anywhere the first time, did it? So it's not as serious as they thought. Their numbers don't add up as well. They're admitting to this. So even though they're trying to sell it as something nasty, the numbers don't compare anywhere close to the flu, let alone worse. If, if, even if, if severity was a problem, forget the novel part for a moment, what it's supposed to also be, and another, but someone else is saying, well, this is just a coronavirus. They haven't proven it's actually novel. And that's what brings up, we have this other, the other guy, the lady that comes out of China, which I think is a big psyop. Oh, well, they, they manipulated this. It's man-made. Okay. That, none of that's been tested. So here's a, for those that are looking for more, if you look at details on, uh, you get beyond the point of that they failed their duty, and you start, and you need to defend the position you want to defend against, uh, if you have to, I would hate, I would say don't. All this stuff sits in your back pocket. This is knowledge you would just start throwing out if it ever became to something. But the, the, the who that's related to the CDC that is being used as an appropriate medical expert, their own information hasn't been consistent. This is another one of those stories that can point out in, in a new, maybe in counterintuitive way, in a way, where they talk about how bad it is, but you look, think about it. The guy says, oh, the rest of the world is at risk to this. Well, you say, wait a minute, but if the rest of the world is at risk, it means that it never was interfered by this thing, whatever you call it. Right? I mean, if the rest of the world is still at risk, the majority of the world, that means it didn't go far. If it went anywhere. Then we have this this morning breaking. Bat who, uh, the who, not the rock group or the owl, backflips on virus stance by condemning lockdowns. The World Health Organization has backflipped on its original COVID-19 stance after calling the world leaders to stop locking down their countries and economies. Well, I don't know if this is truly a backflip. The information I saw was that the who would the, the position of the UN is to not interfere with commerce, generally. They want to present and promote their tourism, so that's one of their pet their pets that they protect. Oh, well, if you lock it all down, then you can't do tourism. That, that's another sustainable non-solution. Non for production, it counters production supposedly. This point is that they're, we're seeing that the the organizations supposedly backflipping. All I want to point out when you read that petition, you'll see how you we question whether or not they are an appropriate medical expert at all, let alone an expert at any. And we find out that they're political. They're not health. It's not a health crisis. It's a political crisis. It's an economic crisis. It's an attack. That what you're looking at is another promoter, and they're just positioning themselves. The point about that is that you can then point out they're not reliable. So whoever the local official was thinking they could rely on a foreign expert, you lie, the statute said, no, you're supposed to do it local. You're supposed to make the identification. You're not supposed to listen to these fools. And so this little report here, it, it, just take it, let the sense say they backflipped. Okay, they're arbitrary and capricious. They have no foundation of understanding. And we can track that back to the fact that there is no test. They don't know what they're dealing with. Remember the lockdown, the second wave was going to fail? Well, if the second wave was anything, it was a, a, an evidence of the failure of the mitigation measures that were installed. Why? Because there is no test to know what they're fighting. The, harsh, the whole point. That's not even the argument in the petition that you'd read. That's the anticipatory defense. The argument isn't even an argument. It says there's a statute that said that put the duty and obligation on a local official to do a thing or five, and they failed at every one. And then they started interfering. That's an unwarranted, for habeas, restraint on my liberty, and for mandamus, 
the destruction of our economy. We've got to stop it as a state. We've got to stop this. And here we get now move over to man-made disaster, natural. What's the, is it a PSYOP? Well, I don't think anything's going on. To tell you the truth, I think there's, they capitalized on the flu. They knew it was a bad years. We may be moving into another one. They're, gonna, they're already advertising that. I don't know. We'll see. Treat it like the bad flu, like you don't want to get the bad flu, and I think you're going to be okay uh, relatively. And uh, here we have the new story I talked about last week, this um, Li Meng Yan Chinese virologist coming out with information about that there's man-made. If you believe this is a thing, you're outdoing the news for fake news for your, against yourself, your own deceit, because there's never been a certification to any of this. But COVID-19 is unrestricted bioweapon, Whistleblower releases second paper alleging large-scale organized scientific fraud. Here's the problem with that. If they, she points out the fraud, you say, oh, yeah, it was all fraud. Yeah, it's all, no, the government's no good. You're not understanding what the real fraud is. That's, this is covering for the real fraud. And the real fraud was that no one, at least the United States, actually did what the law said they were supposed to do to verify. As you'll see in the petition, it says, as I said, the, the governor said the sky is falling. The law required the local health official to step outside and look. And certainly before they issued the order to that everyone needs to have an ACME, the sky is falling umbrella. None of that happened. The governor says the sky is falling, someone was supposed to check. Nowhere did you find anybody doing that. That when someone says this is a bioweapon, well, guess what the weapon was? The weapon is those measures they're holding against you. The measures was that they violated your law. Adjunct policy took the place and displaced local law to advance sustainable development. That's all proofed out in the petition. You don't need to go there, but it's available. And there's more. It could have gone on and on and on. This is not even the point. Problem, problem, part of the problem sometimes with the petition is where do you stop? Where do you, lo where do you hold off? COVID-19 is unrestricted bio. No, it's not. It's not. It doesn't exist. What is the weapon is what, they're, what they've done to your laws, ignoring them and then putting you under, destroying your economies, destroying your ability to produce, putting you in deeper poverty, which they now admit. The who is coming out, what they've done in this backflip, they've actually created the malnutrition and poverty that they were saying wouldn't be affected. Well, what happened in what happens? You'll see in that petition too. But the county knows malnourishment causes three times the the effect, the the symptoms of COVID nineteen as COVID nineteen itself. If you gave it an authority, if you gave it an existence, and so these measures do exact opposite. What did Agenda twenty thirty? I've told you. I've told about this over time. The incremental encroachments, the metastasizing of the cancer within your culture, being changing your culture, and no one steps up to hold to the law of the land, the law itself, at, at least. It goes through and it does what? It just supports the sustainable development. And they, everything they do is opposite. Agenda 2030 was ultimately an economic attack. You're going to be put in pos uh, into austerity, and they called it prosperity. And yet you are going to be digital, you're going to be debt slaves. Without property, without rights, without your law, all by a bureaucratic standard, changeable standards. As, as willy-nilly, as arbitrary capricious as you see the so-called gym, uh, this COVID gymnasties, gymnastics being done, backflipping here with the, uh, uh, the, H, the WHO. None of it's been said. And the reason is that just evidence that they never had anything identified. That should have been enough for everybody to step up. I'm going to say it again. You were, are and you would have been on the right side of history on this one to attack the fundamental cancer. You would have been an anti-cancer agent relative to what's going on in this country, United States of America, and every country that has rule of law or democracy. This, was a, this is a critical, critical opportunity. I'm just watching people not step up. And except maybe one David Tullis over there in Tennessee. I really, uh, again, can't appreciate the effort enough. Just be a voice. Be there. Get and understand what you're dealing with so they don't make it easy. you don't make it easy for them to knock you out. 
that's and I think if you follow what I've been suggesting behind the woodshed, you bring those principles to them. They're going to have a very difficult time. Oh, they're going to expose themselves, and that's a slightly different problem. But the more people looking in, I think, can do can work it out. Uh, this and I'm going to move on. The COVID thing is such a malleable condition. Use every opportunity, uh, and we don't know what minds are working behind the scenes and what's being thought up and what fantasies are coming forward. What dust? What this confetti they're throwing in our face? What smoke they're throwing up? This little story came up was kind of interesting. I don't want to put much more time into just mentioning it. My focus on this was, why was this even a story? Who who came up with the idea that they would even, just even think about this story if it was a news organization that do not publish until news crosses was a web archive. You had to get it from the web archive. President Vice President Mike Pence tests positive for coronavirus eight days after Donald Trump was a story. I want you to read it. My point on this is, what is behind the scenes on all your news and all the information you get? Again, kind of talking about your, we're going to outlaw the first responders take, take take pictures so we can't use that information for ourselves. We're going to attack the, the Julian Assange. We're going to take out all the press, the ones that are trying to give us the information. We're going to make you ignorant as best as we can. But what is behind that says, I'm even going to write a story that says that? And then we hear... That hits the news. That hits the Twitter. We see it. Then you see deadline note to readers. A mistake was made in the vice president and, and coronavirus story. Trying to soften it. I don't care one way or the other than to say, why would you even take the time to write that story if you're an actual news article that your apology even means anything? And I'm wondering then what else is out there, not wondering too much, because I don't worry about it. But this is what most people are confronted with. This one got caught, or not. This might have just been thrown out there. What it reminded me was, as I've told you, you have to step way back and you have to find the facts, not what you're told, what you can track down. When you see a fact, you go try and find, even as a journalist, you go try and find a corroborating piece of evidence. In fact, on that petition, that became maybe an underlying, can't say it was a joke, but an underlying theme. This, this is a well, the story, the, the telling of the journalism here is well written. Well, isn't it the same? Isn't it the case that a well written, factual, journalistic um, report isn't anything more than a set of facts that explains a condition? And in a court case, it's tailored to a, it is, if I can say, prejudice to have to discuss a particular thing. It still has to be that same journalistic fact-finding proof, doesn't it? And so maybe I can appeal to some of you writers, when you want to be journalists, why don't you fact find this COVID relative to a legal wrong that the officials did to harm you and move that through your habeas? But what, who would come up with this story at all? It's not even news. Who would, who would, who's wasting time, or is it a waste at all? I really didn't get into the sensational, it, obviously a sensational story up front, but I, I think this is part of the game. I think this is part of, do we going to spend much, are we going to spend much time on these things? And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of smoke they can make. And so we, we, I just want to remind us, we have to be the ones that focus our own attention. We are the ones that have to be, take the responsibility to be vigilant. We are the ones that have to move our, protect ourselves. We are the ones that are going to have to understand that the system has been contorted culturally inside. It's been adjusted. And the, as in, well, I was calling, I talked to my colleague about one of the court cases. The, one of the attorneys for the mortgage company stood up and said the patent it doesn't isn't in use no more. It's old. It doesn't matter. This is what we have. This is an attorney now. These are the ones that try to you know torn your property, and out and the he didn't get too far with that. We want to talk about the the relevance of a patent today. The judge said sit down and be quiet. Don't talk until I talk to you. Well, the attorney didn't listen so well, and I'm told like fourth hand information to you all. Yeah, me too. The attorney doesn't didn't listen to that advice, almost got himself in a lot of trouble. He was told he was going to get put in jail for contempt of court because he wouldn't stop 
with the nonsensical, frivolous statement that the patent had no authority. So this is very important that you understand the basis for why you are doing what you're doing. You focus in on something and you do not allow someone's ideas to infiltrate you that aren't factual that you can prove. You write the, the truthful journalism of your life that's harming you is the only distinction between the story you would publish for the general consumption and one you would use as a remedy to stop that problem. Moving on, the ski party, see the pandem uh, pandemic, the travel rules that let COVID-19 take flight. The World Health Organization said open borders would help fight disease. Uh, experts in global treaty emphatically agree, but the scientific evidence has never was never behind them. All I want to point these stories out, this is where the who didn't say that you close the borders. They said that you were let people run around, and everyone said, well, if you do that, they're going to get more spreading around. Well, they don't understand how this thing works. Anyway, this was a proof that showed that the, the who's not actually backflipping. There's two stories right back to back about this. The who's opposition to travel ban based on politics, not science. The news was telling you that there was a politics, not science. The entire thing is politics, and there is no science, but the media will, will try and get you to fall into one camp or the other, and then kind of make it all blurry what's supposed to happen. So today we have the who backflipping. In fact, they never really did. We have two stories here to prove it. Why? I say step back. You really have to not... Don't get involved with the facts. You have to find, if you found yourself harmed and you found out who the culprit is, there should be a remedy for that. And if not, then you're a prisoner. Well, however you want to define it. Now, at the same time all this is going on about this nonsense, we have mixed messages coming, why it's so critical to have good information and keep the information you have and don't, don't be turned from it. You'll always reprove it so that you're solid on what you're saying and always advance that. But we have a, at the same time a friend of mine sending me an email that says the, a health authority in the United States is saying they're going to combine on the same report COVID and influenza numbers together. Uh, I find this comes through from the UK to show you the global institution of this political change, this transformation, not a reset. They're moving to the next thing because you're willing to move with them and buy in. This will be the last COVID-19 surveillance report as of uh, October 8, October 2020. The information in this report will be published uh, in a combined weekly flu and com uh, COVID surveillance report on the gov.uk. At the same time we're seeing in the United States, the UK is doing identical timing. How? This is all a plan. This is not, again, outside of a transformation of the, to uh, the total world, and it's, it's not about a health crisis. And so why? my question was, how are they making a distinction between COVID, which is flu-like symptoms, and influenza, which is flu-like symptoms? And this is getting more to the point that how, well, it's not even a position. It's not even a condition. It is a story. Talk about uh, tall tales. And, and and this is going to continue and get worse as the petition you'll read, I hope you read, says that the UN has set us up for emerging diseases, endless emerging diseases are going to be used against you. COVID, this one, COVID-19, gives you the opportunity to stop it in its tracks into the future, folks. I don't know how much more important I can convey to you that point than this is allowing you the ability to stop all that future nonsense. If you just would step up, David Tullis has given a petition to everybody. If you go download it, start looking at it, you can pick from and choose from what you want, keep it integrated so you can get your self protected, hopefully those around you too. Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Appreciate all the stuff in the archive and ability to get in there real quick. Everybody who's uh, syndicating the broadcast and reshowing, thank you very much. I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>